Welcome to my second video on playing D&D solo. The first video talked about character creation and most importantly, character and environment creation together. And you can see a link to that video up here. You don't need to have watched that video to watch this video. They are related but independent. In this video, we're gonna talk about monsters. We're gonna talk about monsters when playing solo because this is a very challenging thing to deal with when figuring out solo because of course the monster manual offers the benefit of an incredible array of monsters but they are all geared toward group play the stats are geared toward group play and to some extent even the basic actions are what type of weapon they might use if they're using another weapon and the damage that does so adjustment is needed and it's not just adjustment of stats that is needed in my opinion it is also adjustment of some concept of what combat actually is and how it plays out and that's particularly true if you want to encounter monsters with a very high challenge rating and you're playing solo with say one character or two so we're going to talk about that and before we do that we're going to just go through some of the basics of even how to use the monster manual and how to find monsters that you want to put into your session because it's not all particularly that obvious necessarily for one thing to use the monster manual you also need to be using the dm guide so we're going to be using both of these books in this video and it is not possible to simply just alphabetically look up a monster in here. It doesn't actually work that way. So we're gonna start by talking about how the monster manual actually works, how you can find various monsters that you might want to use, and what the most important table is for you in the DM guide to help you to help you do that as a well as any GM, but in this case, we're talking about as a soloist. So for this video, we're not gonna need that player's handbook. We're gonna put that aside and we're gonna focus on monsters in your solo play and how to use them so they bring interest and excitement to your session and yet present a formidable challenge that is manageable for you as the soloist. Now, an aside, in my conversation here, I'm gonna be assuming that you are playing one or two characters that you're running one or two characters so to start out we're even going to put the monster manual aside for a minute and we're going to look in the dungeon master's guide this is on page 306 it's the back of the dm guide a really important table this table is called monsters by challenge rating and it's very clear it says this table this index organizes the monsters in the monster manual by challenge rating the challenge rating is referring to the amount of XP that a certain type of monster awards the party when it is killed or when it is dealt with. These refer, the XP refers to the amount of experience that is needed to level up characters. This is important even if you are not using the leveling up rules that are in D&D. And this is going to be the topic of another conversation in this series about leveling up and such but suffice it to say that this is your the first place you should turn when putting together a monster list say for your session because it's important to understand how difficult the monsters will be and how you may or may not need to modify them turning to page 82 in the DM guide, you can see the guidance here that is given to GMs when evaluating an encounter difficulty for a party that is typical. It says the guidelines assume a party of three to five adventurers. So again, right away, if you are considering the fact that you are creating one PC or maybe two, maybe you are creating three, but if you're running one or two, as is often the case, even this table needs to be looked at with that, filtered through that fact in mind. What this table is showing is that if your average party character level is, say, one, that the encounter difficulty 
if it measures 25, is going to be considered an easy encounter. 50 will be medium, 75 will be hard, and 100 will be deadly. These values, in turn, refer back here to this table. And of course, they're in each monster stat, but you can't find them grouped that way. You have to turn here to see, for example, well, what is a challenge rating of 50 experience points? For example, a blink dog is that. So if you had a party of three to five characters with their level being one, and they encountered a blink dog, that would be considered a medium encounter. However, if you're running just one character, and you think about that, indeed, this is an average of three to five characters. You've got one there. A blink dog is going to be more likely to be harder as a harder or a deadly encounter. How you configure this is by looking at the information on page 275 of the DM guide where it's talking about creating monsters quickly. It's giving you this really important paragraph here that says a single monster with a challenge rating equal to the adventurer's level is by itself a fair challenge for a group of four characters. So meaning that one monster with a challenge rating equal to the adventurer's level is going to be fair, but that's with four characters. So the same monster with one character is going to be basically four times harder to encounter. So my rule of thumb is that a challenge rating of a quarter, as it applies to four characters, is really equal to a challenge rating of one as it applies to one character. Meaning, and here's the overall guide if you don't want to think too hard about the math. My rule of thumb for creating monster lists when running one or two characters is to choose monsters with challenge ratings all the way up to and including one for a basic list. So per this, this guidance here for the expected challenge rating, we can consider anything on this chart from a quarter, from zero to a quarter to be a fair fight. Then as you move up the challenge rating, it becomes a harder and harder fight. And you can, you don't need to really, you can see this just by understanding what the monsters are here. So for example, you could imagine if you look at a challenge rating of two, for example, a berserker or a giant boar or a giant elk or a giant constrictor snake, could one character encounter that reasonably and survive is really part of the question. And you can also look at the stats to kind of see whether that would seem to be the case. And we'll get into doing that in a minute. But for a kind of back of the envelope calculation, when putting together, when using the monster manual to put together fair fights with a party of one or two, I would stick to monsters with challenge ratings of a quarter or less for the fair. And then you could sprinkle in challenge ratings of a half and one to your pool of monsters. And we're going to talk later in the video about how you might put that kind of pool together. Those could either be perhaps those are the boss monsters or those are higher level monsters that you encounter along the way. The next table I want to take a look at is on page 302. And these are the monsters by environment table. And they list the monsters here by different types of environment, Arctic, coastal, forest, desert, grassland, etc. And they also list, pull out the challenge ratings. So there's like a double listing. This is very useful. So if you wanted, for example, a list of typical desert monsters that are challenge rating zero, there is a cat, a commoner, a hyena, a jackal, a scorpion, and a vulture, for example. And in the forest, you would find for challenge rating zero, an awakened shrub, baboon, badger, cat, commoner, deer, hyena, or owl. And there are urban monsters, hill monsters, mountain, swamp, under dark, underwater. Very useful table. There's one table that is missing from this book that is curious, has always been curious to me as to why it's missing. And that is a table that is going to group the monsters by type. And now for a moment, we're going to go back to the monster manual because I want to read you something 
in the Monster Manual about D&D monsters, and it is also useful to understand and explain how this book is organized, because this book is not strictly alphabetical. And for that reason, you can't simply, it's not an A to Z guide in that way. It's, there's alphabetizing within types of sections. There are different types of monsters, and they are listed here on page six. They are, it says a monster's type speaks to its fundamental nature. And there are aberrations, beasts, celestials, constructs, dragons, elementals, fey, fiends, giants, humanoids, monstrosities, oozes, plants, and the undead. All monsters in the monster manual here are going to have, be a certain type. And this, for example, this ghast is a medium undead. And the, the size refers to this chart here, which is an indication that all monsters are either tiny, small, medium, large, huge, or gargantuan. And you'll see as you, if you flip through here, so for example, this manticore, that's a large monstrosity. So they're all going to be categorized by size and type. So if you wanted to just find all the oozes, you could do that. However, let's say you wanted to look up and find all of the humanoid monsters in D&D. You can't go in this book and just look up humanoid and find them all because indeed there's no listing for humanoid here. And in fact, we come right after oozes to orcs. Orcs are considered humanoids, as we can see here. They're Here's some medium humanoid orcs, but you wouldn't know that by looking up the category of humanoid. So if you want to create a monster list for a session, for example, that only has constructs in it or only has elementals or fey or some mixture of just say fey and celestials, for example, to create a kind of magical world where the only inhabitants of that world are going to be magical creatures. You have to go outside of this resource to look up online. There are websites that will list monsters by D&D monsters from the monster manual by type, and you can use those resources to create a list for yourself by type if that's what you're interested in doing. I recommend doing that because it becomes very thematic. If you, for example, organize monsters in your session simply by environment, like say you want to, you're walking through a forest or whatever, and you pick hill monsters and you go here and you look at forest monsters, you're getting, the theme is based on the environment. But if you want to create a monster list for yourself that is having a more story theme or a narrative theme, you will need to go outside the, these resources to look up, uh, to get a listing by type. And for the example that we're going to do here, I am going to do that because I do feel that organizing things by type is most thematic. So the first thing I've done is I've listed all the fey characters here and, or all the fey monsters here, and I have pulled out their challenge rating for my own reference because I know that for my basic encounters, I want to be pulling in only monsters that have a challenge rating of one or less, so zero to one. So that would be the Blink Dog, the Dryad, the Satyr, and the Sprite. This leaves the Green Hag and the Sea Hag out, and we're going to get to them because what I'm trying to do here is to create a thematic and narratively driven list of monsters to encounter along the way through my story. And in this case, because we are dealing with the Fae, we are going to set our, they dwell in twilight groves and misty forests. So now we're gonna go back to the DM guide and we're gonna take a look at what monsters by environment there may be in groves and forests. I don't think we have groves per se, but um, we do have a listing of forest monsters here. and we can look it at this list by challenge rating and see what else we want to bring in. Now, of course, for example, we're already going to have some fey listed, so the blink dog is here, as we would expect. But 
I just look through and I think to myself, well, basically, what do I, what do I like? What might, what intrigues me? What might I want to encounter? And I note it down. So in this case, for example, looking, moving through, I like the concept of an awakened shrub. I like the concept of a, I love cats always. I like the concept of an owl. And I move through. A twig blight, I like that. And as you put these in, you may think to yourself that you are feeling a theme. If you're choosing things, for example, that are like the nature coming alive, like the awakened shrub or the twig blight. Now, of course, you can look these up in the book to read more about them. And we're going to do that. But I'm just quickly going through here to create a list. So what I'm going to be doing is I already have on my list base from the Fae. I have the Blink Dog is one. I have a Dryad is two. I have a Satyr is three. And I have a Sprite is four. So I have four Fae that are a, zero, a challenge rating of zero to one. And these numbers, I'm going to create a D20 table. Basically, that's what these numbers are. So as I add things in, I know I need to get 16 things here between 0 and 1. And I'm going to weight them more heavily with below 1. And I'm going to go through and I'm going to pull out 16 things that speak to me for things I would like to encounter. And here we can take a look at the list I created. There's 20 entries in the list. I did do some repeats because I decided as I was going through this, I got the Awakened Shrub, as I mentioned, but there's the Twig Blight and the Needle Blight and the Vine Blight. And I decided I wanted to kind of make this very thematic to walking through a, perhaps a tainted forest or a corrupted area. And so I entered in some of these multiple times to increase the chance of rolling on something like that. I just have the one awakened shrub and um, actually, you know what, now that I'm, now that I'm looking, I'm going to get rid of this cat. I'm going to make the cat the, an awakened shrub also. And again, this is just a table to roll on. We'll keep the owl. I have a commoner in here and I put in three pixies. And I noted the challenge rating here to give myself a sense of the difficulty level. I included two entries here that are challenge rating one plus the dryad. So I've got basically 15% of this is going to be a challenge rating of one. That's going to be pretty tough. Now, as I was looking under the challenge rating one, I came across this fairy dragon, yellow or younger. And I noted it down. It's not part of my table of 20 because I'm feeling as if, again, stepping back to remind yourself, this is for solo play. So I'm acting now in this part of my creating a solo RPG session as the GM. And I'm thinking as the GM, this fairy dragon here, yellow or younger, that to me is suggestive perhaps of some kind of story. Maybe this fairy dragon is in some manner corrupted or corrupting the, the area, this forest here, and our party, our person, whoever it is, is going to need to deal with that in some way. So I just noted this down, even though it's a challenge rating of one, as almost like a, a kind of a boss monster or like a, a monster, an NPC kind of monster. And we're going to take a look later at the entry for Fairy Dragon and see if that starts to suggest something from the, for a story for us. Because again, as you're doing this, what you are doing is not just creating a monster list, but you're also creating and building narrative and you're fitting this, you're building this list as well as you may be building your story. Now you may already have a story in mind. I don't have a particular story in mind. I'm just dealing with the monsters, but the point of this video is to show how you can work with essentially just a listing of material and edit it and cull it and make it into something that could be suggestive of a story. So right now, this random table that I'm creating of encounters has contours already of some type of corrupted environment, some type of corrupted forest environment or some environment that was perhaps magical good and is turning to magical evil or something like that. So this is the beginning now of my 
list of encounters that will happen in my session. So with this thematic list of 20, we have a mixture of challenge ratings and we have monsters that are thematic to the concept of the fae characteristic, the fae trait, as well as those that would appear in a certain type of area. You may be asking yourself though, does this mean that I can only use a very limited number of monsters from the monster manual because I need to keep them with this challenge rating or less? And the answer that I would give is no, not necessarily, but you may need to use the monsters or encounter the monsters in a different way. And what I mean by that is, I want to turn to the very beginning of the monster manual and just review the most basic thing in here about monsters and what is what information we're actually given about what is a monster. And it says that a monster is defined as any creature that can be interacted with and potentially fought and killed. And the two words in that sentence that are crucial are interacted, not necessarily combat, interaction, and potentially fought and killed meaning that not every monster needs to be a combat situation automatically. And that's something extremely important to remember when looking at the ways in which your session is going to involve PCs and monsters. And by the way, it also says here that NPCs are considered to be monsters for this purpose. And indeed, in the back of the book, we might as well take a look at this now. In the back of the book, there are some specific NPCs in given with examples here. So you could, there's Appendix B on page 342 has a list of NPCs, and it says it contains stats for various humanoid NPCs that adventurers might encounter during a campaign from lowly commoners to mighty arch mages. And it says these stat blocks can be used to represent both human and non-human NPCs. So depending on how you were playing your session or campaign out, you could even take basic, you could take the stat block from something here, paying attention to the traits. So this, for example, Archmage is listed as a medium humanoid of any race and any alignment. Whereas you could find something that is like the cultist would be a medium humanoid of any race and any non-good alignment. We have the chaotic alignments here. And obviously you could determine from the description, the basic description that, for example, an NPC guard is going to have stats that would represent more of an, an average guard as opposed to this mage over here. And you could see in the description of their the spellcasting abilities that the mage would have versus the actions, the things that the guard would have. So this is useful to read through and get a sense of the way humanoid stat blocks work because it can help you populate your session with NPCs of various sorts. And you can also make your own thematic ones if you want. So rather than this generic guard, you could come up with some type of guard that might work in terms of the session that you are playing with the theme and everything else. There's a scout here. And, and perhaps the most useful part of this section on NPCs when thinking about populating your world is the end part of each entry where it gives the general description. So like, for example, a veteran is a professional fighter that take up arms for pay or to protect something they believe in or value. Their ranks include soldiers retired from long service and warriors who never served anyone but themselves. So for example, if you were having a story where you were going to say it's a dungeon crawl scenario, you're in an environment looking for something or retrieving something that's been guarded, you could create a veteran NPC thematic to whatever your story actually is and base the stats of that and the abilities and actions of that NPC on this. And same thing with, say, for example, the noble. 
Nobles wield great authority and influence as members of the upper class, possessing wealth and connections that can make them as powerful as monarchs and generals. A noble often travels in the company of guards as well as servants who are commoners. So the noble here could perhaps represent the person either being guarded or maybe the person sending you on your quest and you would have some concept here of who they were and how you could interact with them story-wise. So not to be overlooked is this NPC section. However, back to the back to what I wanted to say about the question of what type of monsters can be used here and encountered in your story that are going to be not necessarily just the lower challenge rating ones. Because what if you want to encounter an orc eye, or you want to encounter, I don't know, an etin, or a ghost, or a flame skull? That's a good one, the flame skull. Let's take the flame skull, actually, as an example. This is a challenge rating for the flame skull. So, All right, so we turn to F in here, and we look, we're going to take a look at the flame skull just as an example of how you might use an encounter with a monster of a challenge rating that is so high it may be unrealistic to encounter that just in a combat situation. So right away we can see the HP on the flame skull is going to be an average of 40 or if you're actually rolling it up 94 plus 18. That is relatively impossible for I think a single character to encounter or even two especially when you look and see some of the particular characteristics of Flame Skull, which one of which is rejuvenation. If it's destroyed, it regains all its hit points in one hour unless holy water is sprinkled on its remains or a dispel magic or remove curse spell is cast on them. So if you were really following the combat through and you destroyed this thing and you were sticking completely to the rules, it might be still around and you would have to encounter it again. It also has advantage on saving throws against spells and other magical effects. So this would be, if you had especially like a single magic user character that was going through, even tougher. So how could you encounter something like this? Do you need to simply ignore all of these really detailed higher level monsters? And my answer to that is no. My answer to that, however, is that you... In running a session where you are having just one character or maybe two, really need to go back to this concept of what is a monster and focus on this interacted with part. Because indeed, enemies in a story can make narrative sense, can drive the story forward if you are interacting with them in a way that is not necessarily just combat. Well, how might you do that? The way you would do that is you would read through the description of what this enemy is and, and essentially treat this monster as a real NPC in the sense that it would be contributing to the story in ways almost everything it can do that's not fighting, let's just say. Now, I understand NPCs fight, but thinking of it almost as like a, a background flavor. It, it would be dangerous, it would be a threat, but it would not necessarily be something that you would have a full-out standard combat against. So for example, the Flame Skull has legacy of life. It only dimly recalls its former life, though it might speak in its old voice and recount key events from its past. It is but an echo of its former self. Its dead transformation grants it full access to the magic it wielded in life, letting it cast spells while ignoring the material and somatic components it can no longer employ. So right away, if you think about what that would actually mean, in, an, in, an, in a story that you were running, that seems very possible to anchor to a story point. Now I realize here in this video, we're really just focusing on, for this series, I'm really just focusing on different aspects of play. We're not using this right now to play out a session, but hopefully you can understand what I'm saying by reading the description and thinking how that could possibly fit in story-wise so that then you could encounter this in some way 
It also mentions that flame skulls can be eternally bound. Intelligent and vigilant, a flame skull serves its creator by protecting a hidden treasure hoard, a secret chamber, or a specific individual. It carries out the directives given to it when it was created and interprets those commands to the letter. A flame skull's master must craft, must craft its instructions with care to ensure that the creature carries out its task properly. So again, story-wise, if you encountered a flame skull, there could be some interaction to ascertain perhaps what it is protecting or who has sent it. And maybe some of that interaction would involve a little bit of like a round of combat or something like this where you're not just actually trying to kill it as a success, but trying to interact with it in some way. Now, this is, so this is a tiny undead neutral evil. Let's pick something that's a little bit less perhaps likely to be clearly a narrative. Let's just look at, let's just look at some other example here. Let's choose, like there's a Medusa here, a Vrock. I'm not sure what a Vrock is, so let's try a Vrock. I don't know what that is. A Vrock. That is, I, what I do know is that's a challenge level of six. So, All right, so this is an example of where you, the, the alphabetical is not going to work for you. The Vrock is not under V, it's in 64, so we'll see what that actually is. It's a large fiend demon chaotic evil, so it comes under the category. It's just, it's a type of demon, basically. So this is, okay, this is a great example here because it shows you how the alphabetical, alphabetical order of this doesn't necessarily always work. So this, you need to look this up. It's on page 64 as a type of demon. And moreover, there's a listing here of demon types. Demonologists organize the chaotic distribution of demons into broad categories of power, known as types. Most fit into one of six major types with the weakest categorized as type one. And indeed this rock is a type one demon. And the, so we'll see what that actually tells us. So if you were dealing with a demon, there's a lot to read in here about the, what the, how demons are the embodiment of chaos and evil and what they, what this actually means and what they can do as a result of that. Also, we can see that demons can summon other demons or summon other creatures. So a rock could summon 2d4 dretches or one rock. In this particular case, if the if you decided that you were going to have a rock as part of your session, you could see, for example, looking down on its actions, it can emit a 15 foot radius cloud of toxic spores out from the rock. They spread around corners. Each creature in that area must succeed on DC 14 constitution saving throw or become poisoned. That is a rule that you could use pretty much as is. While poisoned in this way, a target takes five, that's 1d10 poison damage at the start of each of its turns. A target can repeat the saving throw at the end of its turn, ending the effect on itself on a success. Emptying a vial of holy water on the target also ends the effect on it. Well, aside from the concept that one should always have holy water, this is something more or less that you could lift right from this stat block to impact the environment if you encountered a vrock, for example. The vrock emits a horrific screech. Each creature within 20 feet of it that can hear it and isn't a demon must succeed on a DC constitution saving throw or be stunned until the end of the vrock's next turn. Now, for something like this, if you use this stunning screech effect and you were simply stunned, you would probably just be killed right away because, and we look here and we see the Vrock has 104 HP, that's 11 D10 plus 44, and a whole bunch of types of attacks. Not really something that you could interact with in combat. However, however, you could put this this into your story in some manner and there is an aspect of this like dealing with the spores for example you could look and have some situation where you were in the environment that turned toxic because there were spores out there and dealt and and had to deal with that now you might say to yourself well would this creature just emit these spores and essentially fly away or watch you um fight with them Maybe, maybe not, but they could do anything you want in your own story. 
And the, the point of this could simply be that you are trying to resist this poison, for example. So you can have these kinds of creatures in and have interactions with them, but it has to be heavily modified, in my opinion. Unless you're actually working with a number of PCs and a number of higher level PCs, encountering something that at such a high challenge rating is not going to work out. And it wouldn't work out, by the way, around a table with a GM. A GM is not going to throw, a, I can't remember what the challenge rating of this was, but a GM is not going to throw a challenge rating four or whatever at a party, a first level party, and expect anything to happen that is like a, a fight to the end because it's just probably not likely that that would that that would work out oh it's a challenge rating of six because the actions of this the multi-attack it's going to attack with its beak and with its talons and the beak attack is going to do a hit of 10 and the talons are going to do a hit of four so even from that alone you can see that it's unlikely that this would be encountered until there were higher levels. That's why it's a challenge rating of six. The last point I want to make on this is I've heard people do, and I guess I've done this too, to say, well, this rock, it's a baby rock. So taking down all its stats in some way and a kind of back of the envelope way to do that is just to really divide all the attack stats by four, say, to bring it down divide the HP by four, although here you're still getting an HP of 25. So that's a lot of a lot of things to deal with, and it's got the AC of 15 still. And that could potentially work. You would have to play that out to see how you liked the outcome of the combat in a scenario like that, or your comfort level with the combat. And this gets to a bigger point about just running sessions in general and the use of monsters and combat encounters that Everybody is going to have their own style of play. And of course, this is true with GMs as well, that each GM has their own style. As the solo GM, you too will have your own style and you too will figure out like what type of player you want to end up being in this story. Because again, you're both the, D the DM and the player, but the philosophy of you as the GM is going to impact how you experience the session as a player. And some people will want to focus heavily on as mimicking as much as possible a traditional combat situation in their session. And there are ways to do that. It, it gets harder the harder the enemies are. You'll have to make more and more modifications. What I tend to do is for the challenge rating, the, the monsters that are of higher challenge rating, even in this scenario where we came upon this fairy dragon, I tend to go narrative. I tend to see a higher challenge rating thing that I want to incorporate that when I see a higher challenge rating enemy, I immediately go narrative. I think narratively. So when I see this green hag, for example, that which was a challenge rating of three, or even the sea hag of two, or this fairy dragon, which I think might have been a one, it's yellow or younger, I immediately think like, that sounds like story to me. That seems like story to me. So maybe I'm traveling and I will in some way encounter the green hag, but not necessarily as combat. So let's let's actually look up this, this green hag because, well, first of all, you can read the entire section on hags which we don't have time to do in this video, but I'm pretty certain that just in and of itself, this could create a add to a story and environment. Maybe you're getting to a the section where they live and all, learning all sorts about their, their foul nature, dark sorority and monstrous motherhood. And then the green hag in particular, it says it dwells in dying forests, lonely swamps and misty moors making their homes in caves. I mean, right there, that is a lot of story and could set the framework for your adventure. Maybe this is ultimately where you are traveling to. She's a medium fey, neutral evil, and you would be, she has an obsession with tragedy. Again, these are all 
potential narrative hooks that would go into your story so that by the time you ever encountered this green hag, it wouldn't necessarily be to fight her because you couldn't fight her most likely. She is a challenge level three. If you're alone there, it's very unlikely. Maybe if your character was very high level, you would, might have a fight, but that's not really, in my opinion, the, the point of the higher challenge level, higher challenge rating enemies in the story, in your session, that they're really more based on the story. And you are provided with a great amount of narrative source material here in this discussion of has the general and the green hag in particular and could fit it into the narrative. And perhaps in a different video, when we put it all together, I'll demonstrate how to do that. So to sum up what we've been talking about here in terms of monsters, it is important to think of them as part of the environment of your story and not just combat, 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 that they are threats in the environment. And as we know from other videos or the solo GM guide or just our own thoughts, the environment of our session is key to driving the story. We talked about that in character creation and we've talked about that here as well. The higher level monsters are opportunities to develop narrative and we can see here in my D20 list here that I did pull out this fairy dragon as I mentioned earlier in the video and in a later video in this series we'll see how this particular thematic list that was focused on fey characters for the most part with other things sprinkled in is going to be developed and part of my story and fit together with the environment and the characters I was already creating because what you're doing again as the soloist is you are step by step acting and almost toggling back and forth between your experience of this game session and rule set as a player and an experience of the game session and rule set as the GM and these go back and forth and in the development of the the monsters there is no difference there so we the message overall is that you in dealing with monsters can create a narratively driven list or random table to roll on as you experience the session and that it can be thematic to an environment or indeed it could dictate the environment depending on the uh, pillar say that you start with in terms of creating your adventure you could create an entire adventure beginning with the monster list again important to remember that monsters represent interaction and they represent the potential for combat and killing not necessarily a mandate to do that but overall they represent environmental threats that can be thematic to story <laughs>